Ezra is solving universal challenges at the very human intersection of art, architecture, and historic preservation. Thank you so much for joining us today. I had so much fun learning uh, about your work, and it made a deep impression on me, and I watched some of our lectures. The students here who are lucky enough to take your course, I really I can't recommend it enough. So um, to start with, there's, there's going to be some photos that are going to be revolving. Can you give us some context on what we're going to be seeing? So we're going to see some images from Al-Azraq refugee camp in Jordan. Uh, this is the second largest camp in the country, uh, and it houses around 40,000 Syrian refugees, exclusively Syrian refugees. It's the second uh, built camp in the country. Um, you know, the largest one has around 90,000 people, and these people have been living there for years in this particular camp since 2014. And you see images from uh, scenes from the camps, but also some of the inventions that people are making to alleviate uh, the humanitarian aid failures, and some of the work we have done together with the people, residents of the camp, uh, with the Future Heritage Lab. I think it's really helpful to have these, these pictures, and I know you'll integrate more of them into your, your stories, but one of the things that I really took away from studying your work is that you really have advocated of solving with people rather than for people, that we're sitting here in Cambridge and we can identify what the problems are, but that you really need to incorporate the humanity and the culture and the full people that you're solving for. Exactly, you know, when we are working with these fragile communities, often I mean, you, you want to, you have these best intentions, right? But sometimes, as we know, best intentions might not lead to best solutions. Or, you know, we outsiders are bringing uh, power dynamics, biases in that might perpetuate some of the power dynamics, colonial dynamics in these environments. And it is really important to be aware of that, right? So for us, coming into this uh, region was important to say, okay, how do, where can we, uh, we be most useful? And that is not to just bring our knowledge on top of these people, but learn from them and work together uh, to find solutions where we can mix skills that everyone brings to the table, learn from each other, uh, and then you know, multiplies those voices together. One of, the, one of your lectures, you talked about how um, people in their con like countries will send things to refugee camps that are beneficial to them to send. So you talked about how Amsterdam was sending bikes to the refugee camps and how in other countries would send clothing, but there was a problem with what they were sending. Exactly. I mean, imagine what used to be like a humanitarian aid form can be, you know, reused, recycled bikes from Amsterdam's canal or clothing donations that we think great. There's all this second hand clothing that no one is using. Maybe people can use it there. It's for free. But in fact, you know, when you look at it, it's trash. We are sending them out trash. And partly this trash is also absolutely culturally inappropriate. You know, which Syrian woman is going to wear tight, skinny jeans? It's uh, not something that can be useful in the context. So you've seen some of the images. We have worked with this trash to kind of transform it and make something uh, kind of both critical and um, transformative. Um, in this conference, we, we talk a lot about innovation. And you just wrote this really remarkable book about innovation that was going on in these refugee camps. Um, and what, one of the things I really appreciated was how you took what they would probably consider finding ways to make do and, and appreciated the real innovation in architecture and design behind it. So can you talk to us a little bit about how that changed or how, that, how we should look at innovation given that? So when you look at the ways in which people in the camp and look at this uh, um, fountain, for example, this is made out of plastic buckets, made out of trash to create a feeling of sound and remind people of their home and also alleviate some of the unbearable heat that you find in these camps. Um, it is a kind of, not necessarily solution to something, but it addresses a specific need, a need that is not recognized by our um, parameters of what constitutes humanitarian, um, like human needs in the humanitarian design. Those seem to be in the eyes of the kind of international community based on parameters of efficiency, engineering, you know, kind of, addressing needs of people in a, in a very short period of time, and those needs to seem to are seen as uh, needs for shelter and uh, water uh, and, and food. 
But when you see what people are making in the camps, you see that they are making cultural artifacts, inventions, innovations that are talking about those cultural and emotional needs that are actually essential human needs. And I think we ultimately need to like, reevaluate the way we, uh, we think about aid in this context, and we can learn them best from those communities affected by conflict and crisis. And our last, last um, question, or what are some of the examples of innovation that you saw, these cultural things that really inform so much of your work of saying we need to look at not just as this as, as a person that needs something, but as a human who brings their culture and their tradition and their identity, identities with them? So in the images, you have seen a, a, a photo of this Palmyra arch, like a sand castle that someone, and this one, someone has built in front of the, uh, the ready-made shelter built by UNHCR. This, for me, is such a powerful image because it juxtaposes these two ideas of shelters, right? So you have in the background the kind of standardized one-fit-all solution um, that is uh, giving people like roof above the head. And then in front is this amazing sand uh, castle built out of different parts of sand that the person scavenged from the desert uh, to reference Palmyra, place where they come from, but also to create a kind of monument in a place where no public space and no gathering is allowed. And this becomes a landmark for people to gather, for young people to learn something about history and the elders like talk to the kids about this, like, you know, this used to be in our home. You indeed have history, you have identity, uh, you have dignity, right? And this for me is such a powerful lesson that we need to learn, like the lesson about dignity and the kind of expression that is so vital to us being human beings uh, and uh, having those needs. Really fantastic things to keep in perspective at this conference. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.